know, people look at you and you knew you could see the hate in their eye, but it didn't matter. It's like, we're coming. We've got to set aside this issue uh, of color and start dealing with the real issue, which is economics. I'm gonna keep on walking, keep on talking, marching up to freedom land. We're in this thing for the long struggle, and you know, if it takes filling up the jails, we're gonna fill up the jails, but we're not gonna stop until this issue is resolved. What we call the modern civil rights movement took place during the middle part of the 20th century, nearly a hundred years after the Civil War. Many protests took place in the South, but not all of them. The battleground included urban areas as well. Black Americans who had migrated from the South searching for better opportunities in the North found barriers to their advancement there as well. Protests and demonstrations were held in support of better jobs, better schools, open housing, and the right to vote as people of color sought their piece of the American dream. The thing about that period, it was disappointing, and, and, you know, being an American in a way is to say, to find how little we were part of this great society. The black man wasn't equal to the white man in the 60s. You know, the white man had uh, freedom to live any place he wanted to as a man. But uh, the Negro couldn't. The system itself was uh, segregated, and that it was not going to get any better unless there was some sort of direct action. Milwaukee had its share of protests, most notably the marches for open housing, which attracted national attention. But there were other equally important issues as well. Some were social, some were economic. On this program, we will share a few of the stories from some of the many people who participated. I marched uh, from Selma to Montgomery with her and really didn't understand. I felt more alive and, and more passionate and more hopeful than I felt in a long, long, long time or ever before, really. For me, the issue would have been being forced into the armed services to fight for this country while this country was treating us as second-class citizens. I became convinced that um, not only did the situation have to change, but that I wanted to be part of making that change. Milwaukee's industrial complex during World War II afforded job opportunities for blacks. Most of the jobs were menial, but they were better than picking cotton. That helped spark a population boom. At the end of the war, the city's black population numbered about 15,000 people and was segregated in the city's inner core. By 1970, that population would exceed 100,000. They came up here and they had gotten work through letters, newspaper recruitments. Uh, Chicago was one of the key uh, 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 hubs in which African Americans came to first uh, and then later made their way into Milwaukee hearing about opportunities that existed. But job opportunities did not guarantee that African Americans would be fairly considered for jobs. This young man, African American student at UWM, applied for a busboy job at Mark's Big Boy on East North Avenue there, right at Farwell and Prospect on that corner. It's a different business now. But, uh, and he said, well, I went there and they told me the job was filled. And three days later, I see the sign in the window again. And so I went back again and they told me it was filled. And with that, we said, okay, you go there and apply again. So he went and applied and they told him the job was filled. And we, we had a, a white tester just waiting. So as soon as he reported to us that he was told the job was filled, we sent the white tester in. And they told him he could start in that afternoon. <laughs> and that evening, uh, we had a parade of marches around the Marks Big Bud. 
Givens would lead the NAACP Youth Council in picketing three inner-city restaurants in 1963. At the time, the NAACP was Milwaukee's prominent civil rights organization, and the Youth Council was very active. They were successful with Mark's big boys, but... It really disgruntled a lot of the older NAACPers, and so we had a lot of internal hassles going on. Uh, they wanted to write letters and talk to people and... Uh, to file lawsuits and all of that stuff. And we said, no, the direct action will get it. Givens would leave the NAACP and join the newly formed Milwaukee chapter of CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality, and continue to protest job discrimination. What the young man started was an introduction to the racial discrimination in employment in the entire city of Milwaukee, everywhere. Uh, we started to then look at the companies in this community, and you had no ma minorities in management any place. And I think it's important to qualify the difference in these marches. Our marches were tended to be social, yes, but they had an economic aspect to them. Because if you don't get a job, you know, you can talk all you want to talk. Uh, you're not into the economic side of the society, which is, you know, is terribly important in America. And the beautiful thing about the community is once we demonstrated that we were about action, they would come out. You know, this, you know we'd start a demonstration with the, the core of the people we had, and then um, uh, the, the next day people would be coming from everywhere. Mrs. Lily Pittman and her family moved to Milwaukee from Mississippi. I started out with core the time core. Uh, Janetta Robson, Miss Simpson, and Cecil Brown. We did a lot of marches on the school board. That was something else. You had to walk in the car, this man come storming out of the door. Go back to Africa. <laughs> Knowing me, I said, I wouldn't have been here if you had not brought me here. And Mr. Simpson said, be quiet, be quiet. I said, he meddling me. I ain't bothering him. <laughs> Mrs. Pittman's children were also involved in the protest, especially her daughter, Liddy. I started in, I think, probably middle school, probably seventh, eighth grade, uh, with Janetta Robinson and Ma Simpson, we called her because they started this community thing, community center, and we were one of the first kids they had, and they were just like, they motivated us. They, they made us believe things, you know, like you can do certain things. Like, we bought into it like, yeah, we could do this. And so, here we were. In 1954, the United States Supreme Court unanimously ruled that separate but equal public schools were inherently unequal and were to be desegregated with all deliberate speed. A decade later, attorney and state representative Lloyd Barbie, former nun Marilyn Morehauser, and members of MUSIC, the Milwaukee United School Integration Committee, launched an all-out offensive against the Milwaukee public school system's effort to desegregate. MPS was busing black students to white schools, but still segregating and isolating the black students. Bringing African-American kids from the black community to the white schools and just simply isolating them in one given spot, not allowing them to intermix and intercommunicate with the European students th throughout the school system. That is just as bad as the racial or separate but equal doctrine that we have been practicing for some 60 years. The school desegregation fight had different elements. There were bus boycotts and boycotts of new school construction. Mr. Barbie, uh, how, first of all, how long do you intend to keep this protest up? Well, we intend to keep it up until we have uh, convinced the uh, school board and the citizens of the city that construction for segregation must end. I'm gonna keep on walking, keep on talking, walking on there were demonstrations at school board meetings and short boycotts of the schools themselves. 
The Freedom Schools were a boycott uh, that existed to, uh, there were like three or four of them, um, and the kids actually uh, boycotted the schools, their schools, and um, they went to the churches uh, that housed them. St. Mark's was one, uh, St. Benefit was one. Um, there were a lot of small churches that actually had Freedom Schools in them. Freedom Schools, it was like a couple days, people just left out of school and, and, and schools weren't docking you. We left school, we were pro, this is our protest, and we went to these Freedom Schools down at St. Boniface and Father Gruppy, and we were getting history lessons, history we had not gotten in school. We were learning our history. I helped Maryland organize the school boycott, okay? I taught at the school boycott. We had good cooperation from some of the African-American ministers. Uh, I taught black history, of course. Well, those freedom schools were something to really, really remember because they certainly provided somewhat of an alternative to the public school. I arrived uh, here the end of August, the first day of school, 1965, and um, there was a school boycott, which no one had told me because I was absolutely new to, new to Milwaukee, having gotten off the bus the night before. Although she was new to the city, she supported the protest. Many people here who were black didn't know they were segregated. It was so different in many instances of where they'd come from that this was like dying and going to heaven. Teachers were kind of frightened because uh, there were very few black teachers, and so they did not want their heads stuck out. I was a fool. I got here. Didn't know I could have gotten. I didn't even have tenure. I didn't even know I could have been gone. Along with the protest, Barbie and the NAACP filed a lawsuit charging that the school system practiced and allowed segregation. At the time, the NAACP was also involved in the open housing conflict and had little money to support the school desegregation suit. When we looked around town, we couldn't find any money. We all the nice people who wanted to give money had just about given it and were now looking to us for something much more creative. She sought financial assistance from her union, the National Education Association, through a special fund it had established. It was through the DeShane Fund, after I went to a convention and found out what was going on, because I had no idea, that the DeShane Fund offered these services to teachers who were in segregated situations. And, uh, but they had never been solicited by a northern teacher claiming that there was de jure uh, segregation in a large northern city. With funding secured, they continued gathering evidence and protesting. In 1976, federal judge John Reynolds ruled that Milwaukee public schools were indeed segregated. The school board appealed to the United States Supreme Court, which ordered a new trial. Three years later, the case was settled and the school board agreed to implement a five-year plan to desegregate the schools. The fight for civil rights was also being fueled by the growing war in Vietnam. My brother comes back from Europe in the Air Force, decides he wants to buy my mom a house, then he's going back to England. Took her up on Capitol Drive, there's a house out there with a for sale sign in front of it, and he goes up in uniform and he knocks on the door and he inquires about the house. And the lady tells him very bluntly, we don't sell to niggas. The open housing struggle would put Milwaukee in the national spotlight. It too would take years to resolve. In 1960, attorney Lloyd Barbie and then law student Tom Jacobson devised the first northern sit-in demonstration in Madison to dramatize the need for a statewide fair housing law. Two years later, Bell Phillips, the first African American and woman elected to Milwaukee's Common Council, sponsored a similar citywide measure. She was outvoted 18 to 1. The housing crunch was severe in Milwaukee. The African American community had tripled in size between um, 1950 and 1960 and, and grown again by 1967. Um, but the opportunities to rent beyond a certain restricted area um, didn't increase. And, and the open housing campaign was not so much so that people could live in Brookfield or Mequon, it was so people could live on 27th Street. 
we have tried every means possible to bring fair housing legislation to the city of Milwaukee. Father James Grappi became an advisor to the NAACP Youth Council in 1965. A native Milwaukeean, Grappi had been active in the organization's effort to desegregate the public schools. He also worked in the South that summer with the Southern Christian Leadership Conference's voter registration drive. So did Peggy Rosga. I saw amazing poverty. Um, it, it totally changed my life, totally changed my life. When I came back, I saw Milwaukee through new eyes. She joined the Youth Council and began protesting the injustices she saw. So did Betty Harris Martin. My father and my grandmother on my father's side um, were a part of when segregation was really segregation. And my grandfather's father spoke to a, a white girl and for speaking to her, he was killed. And he was made, my father and, and grandmother mother was made watch as they ran a tractor back and forth over him until he was level with the ground. And I made her a promise, I made him a promise um, that I would continue to fight um, for civil rights as long as I could continue to walk. Squire Austin was one of the Youth Council's commandos. The commandos were a police force that we put together to protect the leaders of the, the marches and uh, uh, the speakers and the people that were actually doing the march. That was the philosophy of the commandos. We're not going to mess with you. We are going to protect these people behind us, okay? But no, we are not nonviolent. If you attack us, we will not ball up in a little knot and let you do whatever you want to do. We have dignity, we have pride, and we're demanding that you respect that. Tension increased as protesters continued to press for equality and their efforts met with little success. Relations with the police, which had not been good, became more strained. If you participated, you went to jail. Once they get you handcuffed and in the wagon or in the elevator, uh, you're gonna get hit. You're gonna get beat. We knew that was coming, you know, so. There's nothing you can do about that. You can complain all you want, but you have no proof. I remember being arrested on Wisconsin Avenue and being taken to jail. And when I got down there, I remember being put in a room and I, re I remember being whooped with a rubber hose uh, across my legs. And I think that's another reason why I have problems with him right today. But I remember being whooped, and I remember being told, now tomorrow we don't want to see you out here, because if we see you out there, you think today is something, wait until tomorrow. On July 30th, 1967, violence broke out in Milwaukee as police attempted to break up a fight at a downtown entertainment club. The riot may not have been as destructive as the recent violence in Newark or Detroit, but it did take its toll on the city. People talk about the riot, quote unquote, that took place in Milwaukee. I look at it and I say, you know, without someone like Father Groppy to siphon off that steam and that energy and that anger, you would have had a real riot here. So in some aspects, you achieve the relieving of the anger, the explosiveness that this country experienced, but you didn't experience it here in Milwaukee because there was a valve to kind of let that out and a legitimate confrontation over what our disagreements are. Well, the worst thing I remember is sitting on my porch and watching the National Guard go by in Jeeps and trucks pointing guns at us. That's the worst thing I remember. As a matter of fact, that really got me much more active than I had been. On August 28th, 200 civil rights protesters marched across the 16th Street Viaduct to Milwaukee's South Side, where blacks had not been able to live. They were met by about 5,000 angry white spectators who threw rocks, bricks, and obscenities at them. I grew up on the South Side. When we marched across the viaduct, 
we marched to an area where I hung out as a teenager. The African-American teenagers in the Youth Council were terrified. Um, I thought they were wrong. I, I thought it won't be. Um, it turned out they were right. Um, it was a real another eye opener for me that um, that the hatred that had been somehow under wraps was uncovered, and it amazed me that I hadn't seen how deep and how pervasive it was before that. We didn't realize just how bad it was going to be till once we got there, you know, and uh, we just dealt with it the best we could. I didn't know that racial hatred ran so deep as it did and how the people, um, they were so angry and what we were protesting for was not to take anything away. It was just for the right to be able to intermingle with all people. Instead of being disheartened, the Youth Council's resolve was strengthened. We are going to march again on the south side this evening. We're going to begin here at the Freedom House at 6 o'clock, and we're going to take the same route that we took last night. The second night, the protesters were met by a bigger and angrier crowd and the national news media. The ensuing confrontation caused Milwaukee to be dubbed the Selma of the North by journalists covering the event. I labeled Milwaukee the Selma of the North uh, following the initial marches across the 16th Street Viaduct when uh, peaceful protesters marched into the primarily uh, white ethnic working class side of town and uh, faced incredible opposition, um, including uh, racist chants and signs. They had things thrown at them, rocks, bricks, sticks, even uh, human urine and feces, things like that, people holding white power signs. And then they were also attacked. Later that evening, the Youth Council's home, Freedom House, was mysteriously set on fire and burned down. We were in the Freedom House, and that was a scary moment. When the tear gas came up into um, the Freedom House, and we were watching television, and then all of a sudden we're choking, and we don't know how we're going to get out because... Uh, the front door is where, and the windows is where it came in, and we're trying to figure out, should we lay low? And I'm being told, stay down, because tear gas don't get down this low. And I said, oh, but I'm coughing. I, I've got to come out of here. And I remember getting to a window, and the window was broke. And I remember someone hollering and saying, jump, Betty, jump. And I was afraid to jump but I knew I couldn't stay in there because the fire had started. And he says, oh no, you must jump, you have gotta jump. So I said, oh, I'm gonna take a chance because it's too hot in here. And I remember jumping, but I don't remember where I landed. I remember jumping out, you know, to get out. Fire department came and the police wouldn't allow the fire department to put out the fire because they said there were snipers in the area. The only people we saw with guns were police officers. But the Freedom Walkers continued to march and gather new recruits. Chuck Cooney lived just off of the viaduct. He and a neighbor accepted the invitation to join the marchers. I had seen the pictures of the integration of the Southern universities and the federal marshals and people yelling hateful things and the looks of, but it, it just, until, until I actually did it, I, I just, I, I didn't think there was, that much hatred and, and, and I guess that much racism and I just didn't, I didn't believe it. But that night, uh, that very first march, I, I remember saying, you know, I remember actually praying, you know, I hope, it was kind of a myopic vision, Nancy and I get out of this <laughs> in one piece. What that, those marches really did is, is they, they kept a focus a high focus because they brought a national spotlight on Milwaukee because of the reaction of the marchers as they went into the south side of Milwaukee. And it highlighted the prejudices in the city. The protests continued for more than 200 days. The Freedom Walkers' efforts may not have been successful locally, but they did succeed at the national level. 
the open housing campaign here and the national attention uh, that it attracted helped spur passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1968, or otherwise known as the Fair Housing Act. Back then, just to see my family being able to move into a better home, you know, was exciting. It was, it was, it was really great. You know, my father he worked hard all his life. We could afford to move into a better neighborhood, and uh, but yet we couldn't. And then that day came where we could. So it was all worthwhile, you know. Everything we did, every march we made was worth it. We fought for equality and opportunity that we could not be denied based simply because of the color of our skin. That's the world we fought for. It's not the world that we have today. With integration comes the dispersion of our community. As a community, as a whole, if you stay together, we have more power and we just disperse and we don't have that community anymore. I think it's a better place, but I'm awfully saddened by the fact that it could be a much better place because I still get the feeling that, uh, that there are boots in this community on the necks of people that they shouldn't be on. And there's an old axiom, I think, that fits that. You, you can't keep your boot on my neck and make progress. I think Milwaukee has tried to hide from its racial past. Um, and it's, it, you can't, it's there. And you may as well acknowledge it uh, and, and make a determination that you want to turn away from the hatred and the ugly um, toward justice and something beautiful. I think we've made race an issue that many times economics could smooth. Uh, but if you in your heart don't believe that other people are as equal as you, it is indeed a difficult task. And so I believe that education helps improve that. We made it across the bridge, but then after we got across, now we're facing some of the same problems today as we did just to get across the bridge.